about you. Good evening, everybody. This is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight, and my guest tonight is actor Jimmy Dempster. How's it going, Jimmy? It's going good, brother. Good to finally uh, meet up with you face to face. Hey, it's great. Well, sort of. Yeah, hey, it's great finally, you know, finally talking to you, you know, because we kept on hitting each other back and forth on social media. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's crazy. It's funny you mention that too, man, because that's how a lot of these things happen. That's one of the things I like about social media is I've, uh, you know, you get a chance to chat with people who you normally probably wouldn't get to see a lot or you wouldn't be, you know, you just countless times i uh i get hit up for messages all the time to do interviews uh people have reached out to be part of their projects so i think it's great i think so too now let's talk about um a film you're getting ready to be in it's coming up i had scott hansen caitlin and chelsea lesage on who played the virginia bitches in the movie devour and you're also part of it so how did you become part of that uh vampire horror film with a lot of rock stars in it yeah man that's uh that's one of those movies that everybody seems to be talking about now because it's what's not to talk about right it's got everything you could possibly want from a horror film all wrapped up in one nice big bag bloody gross disgusting package (laughs) monsters werewolves you know vampires bitches metal music what's not to love (laughs) heck yeah so um you gotta um You got to work with some of the actresses on set. Um, you got to work with some of the Virginia bitches. So, what was it like to work with Chelsea and all them? Uh, they're all great. I was on probably for a couple of days. I think I did uh, three or four days on that project. Um, I, everybody was really cool. It's just one of the good things I love about indie horror, especially, is the fan base and the people involved are extremely loyal. And uh, it's 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 like working with your friends, essentially. You know, everybody's a fan. Everybody. Some of my favorite directors and people that I've worked with, especially on projects like horror related, is you could speak to each other in uh, in films. You speak to each other in references. You know, they're like, oh, you remember the scene in Evil Dead where you know this happened and blah blah, and they go, yeah, I get it right away. You're tuned in with the director. You're tuned in with the script, and usually the people that you're working with around you as well. So I absolutely love that stuff because at the end of the day, we're all fans. You know. Oh, we're huge fans. Uh, tell me about the character you play in Devour. Oh, yeah. I play. It, it's kind of weird getting used to talking into it, calling it Devour, because for the longest time it was the Virginia Bitches. Yeah. Which is a title I still love. I love that name. Devour's a great name, too. But uh, I, underst- I understand why uh, they couldn't use the name Virginia Bitches. It's still in the movie, though, which is cool. It's the name of the band, so you can't really change that. But... Uh, yeah, I, I saw that they were casting, and I had been speaking back and forth, speaking to social media. I've been kind of going back and forth with Scott for probably the last probably two years. Um, he was shooting some projects. I was doing some projects, getting ready to come out to Georgia. And I had seen that he was casting the film. He was looking for some uh, stuff that we're going to be doing, some second round of shooting. And I reached out to him. I said, hey, if you have anything available, man, I'd love to work with you. You know, I, I love your stuff. I've seen some of the stuff you've done. And he goes, yeah, man, sure. Would you mind reading? I said, no, no problem. So sent out a part in, uh, for this a character called Fat Carl. <laughs> it was like a, a sleazy concert uh, manager. He's like a, a band promoter. Um, and he's not necessarily on the up and up. He's kind of a shady guy. He's the type of guy that always fuck over uh, bands. And having actual bands on the set was fun, too, because I got a chance to chat with them. And they'd be like, oh, yeah. In between takes, they'd be like, yeah, we've dealt with some shady characters like you, and you you nailed it. <laughs> so that's always fun. Yeah, um, I saw a picture of you um, as your character in Devour, man. You were pretty creepy and shady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's just, and never mind the character. That's just me. No. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's one of those things where, like I said, I reached out to him and he uh, offered me the part to read and I read for it and like a day or two later I found out I was cast and I was like, yeah, hell yeah. I couldn't wait to get on that project. Couldn't wait to work with him. Couldn't wait to, wait, uh, couldn't wait to work with everybody involved in that project. I mean, there's so many names on board. I mean, you got, what do you got? Wayne Anderson now you got doing the, uh, the effects. That's insane. 
Oh, heck yeah, it is. And I still can't wait to see it. I've been dying to see it because I liked his uh, other film, uh, Bad Candy, because it's set in the same universe as Bad Candy um, when I had Scott on when we were talking about it, which I think is pretty cool. And um, I love how they were giving teases on, you know, social media. You got to see what the werewolf look like. And there's going to be like tons and tons of blood, which I love. And I, I'm, I'm. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really cool how you mentioned Bad Candy. It's really cool how everything kind of connects in the same universe. There's a, uh, like, for example, not necessarily spoiler wise, but there's a, a scene that I'm part of. There's a scene that I'm part of where I'm heading somewhere that connects specifically to a certain character in the bad candy film that uh we we kind of co-mingle over a phone call and i'm really curious to see how it connects from that film going into this one it's really cool i i'm looking forward to it because um um i picked one of the cool perks in their indiegogo campaign i had to i had to get i had to get the blu-ray because i support physical media because I know this movie's going to be good because I also own Bad Candy and I love Scott Hansen's films. I mean, I like the uniqueness of how he you know does his uh, filmmaking and all that. So um, I'm looking forward to it. But I would love to uh, try to find out how to how to get a Virginia Bitches T-shirt. <laughs> I see. It's funny, man. I asked. I actually asked about that when it was the Virginia Bitches originally. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, "Yeah, I'd love to." And this was even before I was part of the project. I was like, "Man, that's a freaking rad shirt. Just the lips, the fangs." Yeah, and it says Virginia Bitches. Simple, basic, but there was just there was some so punk rock metal about it. I was like, "Man, I, I have to." I, I reached out to. I asked one of the producers. I was like, "Yeah, how do we go about getting one of those shirts?" And this was before anything was even. Yeah, I think kind of even really in talks of being made. So. But I see they're available now, but you can get them now. Oh, I'm going to definitely get one because I'll support that, man. I'll be walking around because I like to support indie horror filmmakers and indie horror films. So if there's an indie horror film I like, I try to get like the movie and I'll try to get the t-shirt. And it's a good conversation piece because like when I go to film festivals, horror film festivals or conventions, people will be like, hey, where'd you get that, you know, cool tea at? And I go, well, you got to check this movie out, you know. And yeah, hell yeah. Heck yeah. Another thing we both have in common, we both love horror and pro wrestling. Um, we both love, you know, AEW. So what's your thoughts about how pro wrestling and horror always connect with each other? Because you always see so many pro wrestlers that um, give their Amish to uh, horror films because of their gimmicks and characters. I think that's actually a really good that's definitely that's actually so true. I mean, if you think about it, if you go all the way back to Roddy Piper, you know he ended up in uh, They Live. He was the lead in that film with John Carpenter. And uh, wrestling, I think, and heavy metal and horror, it, it all kind of goes together somehow. I'm not really, I'm not really entirely sure what the uh, the formula is, but somehow it just all connects. It makes sense. It's, uh, I, back when EC, remember ECW? Oh yeah, good old ECW. Yes, I do. Good old ECW man. I was there in the early days for that. That when they were uh, when they were down in Jersey, we used to go constantly to those shows, and it was just the people who would go to the shows. And I was one of them, and we'd hang out. Eventually, I became part of the ring crew, and I would hang out backstage and all that stuff. And the people who would go to the shows, all of us, we were just you couldn't tell if we were heavy metal fans, if we were horror fans, or what we were, right? Because <laughs> everybody black t shirt, you know, heavy metal shirt. <laughs> bloody like evil dead or something like that you know just it, everybody it's a big family and everybody just kind of blends in and just falls in when they're together so yeah definitely connected man i'm so jealous of you, you got to see all those live ecws i never got a chance to be in that uh arena but you know i always watch the pay-per-views and everything but man that was that's history it's not there anymore you were part of history um so um what was it like uh you know, I was setting up the ring and um, going to be um, backstage at ECW. Did you ever get to like meet Raven or Taz or any of them? Yeah, I've met all those guys a lot over the years. Even uh, when they transferred over to TNA Wrestling in Orlando, we moved to Orlando and a lot of those guys came up over there and got into their second or so run, if you want, you know, if you will, of their careers in TNA Wrestling. Um, yeah, it's it, it's essentially just another day at the office. I think you know it's no not much different than going on set. Hey, how you doing? 
you know, you don't want to be running around taking pictures or trying to be like, hey, you know, you try to keep a professional veneer, you know, like, hey, how you doing, man? Nice to meet you. Hey, so what are we doing today? Okay, cool. You know, but inside you're like, man, that's so freaking cool. Just got to hang out with this guy, Rob Van Dam, Kurt Angle. <laughs> it's the coolest thing. I love that. I miss them days. And uh, then, and then especially TNA Wrestling, we were there all the time. The Impact Zone was like 20 minutes from my house in Orlando at the time. That had to have been so what we were. What was that? I said that had to have been wild to be at the Impact, uh, you know, zone right there, you know, seeing all the wrestlers and Impact Wrestling. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, it was great. They really just a bunch of really cool guys and ladies. Yeah, kick ass shows. They put on like two, three shows a week and then they would do the pay per views every month. So it was great. It was, uh, it, it's, it, it's, I don't know if, I don't even know. I don't really know if that's a thing you could do now. I mean, now everything's a big production, like WWE. You know, everything's a huge production. They have pay per views. I think every two weeks, every time I turn around, they have some big show on. I try to. I'll I'll tune into like the main ones when I can, like SummerSlam, WrestleMania, you know, stuff like that. But uh, and then AEW, like I said, I told you before, I catch their shows every month. I'm I'm a little uh, loose during the week with the weekly shows, like Dynamite and all that. But uh, I one thing's for sure, I know I'm going to catch the pay per views because I know they're going to be good every time. Oh, they're they're always good. Uh, the you know the pay per views. I mean, they never disappoint me because you know, like I said, I'm just I'm a um, I'm a huge uh, Darby Allen fan. Um, I like him. He kind of has that horror rocker skater vibe too, which I like. Yeah, he's a good kid. He's. Uh... I like the fact that kind of Sting took him in and kind of put him over a little bit, kind of helped branch him out. But uh, yeah, I like he's got that hardcore style too. He does a, he's very horror themed. Anybody with their face painted, I, I automatically dig. I think so too. Part. Since you hung out with uh, some of the wrestlers, um, have you ever thought about training to be a pro wrestler at one time? Not really. Um, I've been to a couple of courses and a couple of classes. And I've taken some basic training, but I've never really had any drive or motivation to do it. Um, It's one of those things where I've always been a fan ever since I was a kid. And, but never really saw myself doing it. I never really had any aspirations. Nah, unfortunately it would be cool though. I guess maybe, I don't know. Who knows? (laughs) You you got the persona and the physique to be a pro wrestler. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's funny. It's funny because it's the, not the first time I've been asked that. Oh wow! It's funny you mentioned. Now, um, yeah. Now let's talk about you were in a uh, Lifetime film. You know, there's a lot of these crazy Lifetime thrillers um, where you were uh, got a chance to uh, interrogate Olivia Jordan, uh, Miss USA, Miss Universe. I saw that clip you sent me, man. Boy, you. Boy, she was really playing that part really good because she was ready to get beating by you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it was either going to be me or it was going to be my massive sidekick there, my the big man. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, it was just one of those things where, you know, he was doing all the... Usually, I'm the guy. I'm the guy who's, you know, interrogating somebody or choking somebody or killing somebody or doing whatever it is, but... I was just basically the messenger and, you know, my man there had her by the throat and all that. <laughs> yeah. Olivia is such a sweetheart. I mean, everything that she's got going on for her in her life, I wish her all the best success. Um, I mean, as far as being terrified in the scene, yeah, she could turn it on and turn it off just like that. So it didn't really require much of, uh, of me to really, I mean, she could just pull it out of nowhere. She was really good in that, but yeah, I love working with those. I love those films. They shoot a lot of those out here, and uh, I'd like to do more of them, actually. I think I might. Oh, that's pretty cool. Maybe, maybe who knows, maybe you do a Hallmark film. <laughs> yeah, why not? I don't see why not. I mean, about, probably about 10 years ago, I never saw myself doing that, but you never say never. Now, um, let's talk about your uh, uh, good friend and business partner, uh, Lee Thongham from Thailand. Um, you guys did a, a lot of work together you know, over in Thailand. So how big is the horror film industry down in Thailand? How, how popular is horror down there? 
Horror is pretty good. Um, actually, the film industry and in overall is actually really, really picking up steam out there. I've been out there, I think, two, three times already just in the last year, um, especially since uh, COVID hit here. It was a little bit more kind of free and easier to go over there, um, uh, you know, especially after about the first year or so. Once things started to clear up, it was just I found myself going back down there more. And the, the industry has really taken off there. I don't know if it has to do with, with Tony Ja expanding because he's from there and that just making a bigger name worldwide. Or, but uh, for whatever reason, it's 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 really coming along, and I, I'm kind of on the ground floor in a sense over there, kind of getting in on the ground level. So to be able to kind of take off and, and make a little bit of a name over there, I'm, I'm 100 percent in. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and you also there's a Thailand uh, horror film. Um, you sent me a, a, a teaser trailer for it um, called "We Are Here." Man, that looked in, yeah. dude. That looked like brutal, intense. When I was watching that, I was like, "Damn, this looks good." So, um, can you tell me a little bit about that and when that's going to be coming out and what's it about? Yeah, um, it's actually uh, the first uh, kind of of its kind. It's uh, U.S. Thai co-production dealing with sci-fi and horror and time travel. Uh, it explores a lot of Thai culture and some of its. Uh, history some of it good some of it not so good it's uh it's got a lot it deals with a lot of cult and a lot of uh and just basically yeah, like thai culture good and bad um and explores a lot of that and time travel the film jumps from here to here so that's pretty uh pretty exciting that's always fun people love time travel projects you know they like a lot of it especially if it's mixed with horror and sci-fi all together so you can have that great film. And, you know, I watched the trailer like three times, you know. I like it and I can't wait. So when is it supposed to be coming out? Yeah, the, um, the one that I sent over to you is an early, kind of like an early kind of teaser. Uh -huh. um, it just was at Con. We were just at Con uh, last month. Um, so it's. I think they're going around doing like a, like regional releases. They're doing like pre-sales here, pre-sales there. Mm -hmm. I'm looking to probably, I think we're probably going to hit the AFM, the uh, the film market. It's going to be in Vegas this year. Nice. So I think they're looking at, uh, yeah, Vegas this year. I think it's November. They're looking for uh, a screening there. And then probably, I think they're going to look to do a worldwide release right after that. That's pretty cool. Um, so ha it'll be, be kind of crazy. It'll be, it'll be, I think it'll be shortly after if, um, if I'm not mistaken, if the Vower gets released, probably this Halloween, it'll be almost back to back. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a nice kind of one two punch going into the end of the year, oh. which will be pretty cool. The follower looks pretty good too. I mean, that's that's gonna. Be, I think that's gonna be one of those good ones. Uh, a lot of uh, people in the horror community are gonna really like. Yeah, I think I think so too, man. Because it's just balls to the wall, just crazy horror blood action like all, and anything you can ever want is all wrapped up in this one film and it's insane and it's only a continuation too from what i understand i um, i know everything goes right i'm so excited about that there's another horror film i'm excited about um it has nicholas cage in, uh it, he's in it it's called long legs and they kept on like doing little teasers and clippets of this film i mean it's pretty eerie, man, and I love how they tease it because you know when you watch a trailer, you, uh, you almost see the whole film. You know, you can kind of guess. But this, they kept on doing yeah. like little clip. I'm so looking forward to seeing, you know, Long Legs and whatever Nicolas Cage does is golden. I'll see anything of Nicolas Cage in it, man. Yeah, I'm actually the same way. I mean, Mandy, you know, from just it, it, it's almost. It's tough to keep up with the stuff that he does because for a while it was like, you know, oh, geez, and it was almost a joke, right? Everybody would be like, oh, no, the Nicholas, he was, it, he would parody himself and do all that stuff. And it's no secret. But uh, yeah, dude, the last like five or 10 years, I would say, he's really come around and he's come back for sure, like with both barrels, just knocking it out of the park every time with these crazy, and he, he really found his stride. I think later on, go figure. I mean, not that he found his stride like he's just some new guy. <laughs> you know, like, uh, at, at this point in his career, you know what I mean? 
it's it, the stuff that he's done has just been freaking amazing. I think so too. And I just saw his uh, latest horror film uh, called Arcadian, which is pretty good too. And I love, I love the unique creatures in that film. It really kept you on the edge of your seat. Um, if you ever get a chance, you should check out Arcadian. That was a good horror film with him in it too. Yeah, I've heard of it, man, but it's it's everything I could do to try to put everything together uh, to pick up. Um, I'm always behind on TV shows, movies. I mean, I, I have a list of things that I want to see, and I don't always get around to them when I want to. But that's definitely on the list because, uh, like we said, we don't miss a we don't miss a Nick Cage film. Oh heck, you no! Know. Now, um, <laughs> that's true. I'm I'm the same way. So, um, I just watched your um, indie horror uh, short film, The Box, dude. Oh, yeah. oh my god, that movie kept me on the edge of my seat. I mean, there were so many great cinematography pan shots. Um, one of my favorite pan shots was in the film where you were uh, dragging your victim, you know, like like in the background, you see this tree, and you see all this fog smoke, and, and I love the lighting on it, the silhouette of you, you know, dragging, uh, you know, your victim, you know, slowly, but in this creepy, eerie way. That was a beautiful shot. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. That's, uh, once again, Lee Tonkum, that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, him and Brent Hackney was, uh, the DP and the three of us got together and we're just like, look, let's make an indie project that, you know, we could take to the festivals and, uh, just kind of see where it goes. We'll strip everything down to its bare essentials, you know, right. Uh, we'll focus on atmosphere and we'll focus on tension and hopefully have some shots that look pretty cool. Right. You know? without being too boring originally we were going to do a feature length film but uh time and money and and everything kind of you know going all over the place we just uh decided to shrink it down to a a short film a short feature if you would because i think it's like a little over a half hour maybe like 30 minutes something like that yeah it was 30 minutes uh, and i I just loved it um i loved the uh the music score in it because um when you when your character kept on getting near the the chest or the box, when you hear the music playing, it has that eerie, fucked up tension feeling to it. Every time your character gets near the box, it just uh, it just feels like it's part of the character in the film. The bo- box, the tension of the music. Every time you get near it, and I also love the shot where you're sitting there. Um, looking at the box and I love how it zoomed in like you were really trying to look through the keyhole. That, that, that was a great shot. Yeah, it's, I appreciate that, man. We've gotten so many compliments on it. That, that project has done so much more than we ever thought it was going to, because like I said, we submitted it to the festivals and it's been around the world. It's been, there's, I don't think there's anywhere it hasn't been. It's played, so many festivals and the response has been really good. You know, I've had the opportunity to go to a couple of them, a couple of the festivals. And when you talk to the people coming out, if you had a hundred people in the seating, you know, you, you'd get 99, a hundred different uh, interpretations of what's going on, you know? So uh, we knew that kind of going in, we left it ambiguous in spots because uh, I'm a big believer. It's always better to just basically, Instead of, I don't like when things are written out and spelled out for me when I'm watching a film. So that was our decision to pretty much leave it that way. It's like, okay, we'll play the thing through. And then if you follow to the end, and if you could put it together basically any way you want to. And when people were coming out of the screening and talking, we knew we had something that people were going to chat about. At least if we did nothing at all, we made uh, a crowd pleaser, you know, for some people to talk about. Yeah, your character in the film. Um, I don't know how you were able to turn your character on and off in the film. Um, there was times where your character was very vulnerable and, um, you know, also, you know, very brave, especially with that creepy demonic voice in your head. It kind of reminds me of like, like a alternate self of you inside your body that's telling you to do this like messed up thing things um in your mind you know where you don't want to do it but you end up doing it anyway it just like 
allures you to it. Um, so how did you prepare that role? I mean, you had to turn out on, on and off from being vulnerable to, you know, uh, you know, being brave and the badass at the same time. How did you prepare for that role for that in that type of film? I, I actually, uh, I relished in that because at the time we shot that, I was, I, I was looking for something different. I was looking for something a little bit more at the time. I was doing, I think, two or three years back to back of like, uh, you know, bad guys and villains, and which I love. I love that stuff. You know, I think it keeps you sane. <laughs> you know, th- those are the people that we've always rooted for in the movies or anything like that. You know, I've always related more to the villain, I think, than the, uh, the you know, the Boy Scout with the white hat. The good guy, so-called good guy, I guess. But uh, I, I just wanted something a little different at the time. And I, we talked about how it, we didn't want this guy to be like a badass. We didn't want him to be, uh, you know, he could be a villain, he could be a hero, which that's up to the interpretation. But uh, I really, really leaned more into the uh, the vulnerable stuff and the the, the emotions and the, the facial expressions and stuff like that was pretty much what I focus more on than uh, than anything else. Yeah, yeah especially your uh, facial uh, expressions and mannerisms, especially in film when your face was painted like a clown. Um, the way when you look at you in the film through your eyes, it just had that that sinister feel, you know, to it. Cause you were putting on the makeup. Um, and when you like look straight in your eyes, you just had that uh, sinister feel about you, which really engages the uh, film goer into the films. Like, okay, he has this makeup on, you know, and you know, he's, you know, he's at this, you know, party. Um, what's going through his crazy mind. You just get that vibe off of you. Yeah, you're like, what is wrong with this guy? This guy is in so much pain. Uh, it, it, it deals with tragedy and loss. So I really had to pretty much get all that across in that kind of final scene, not for <laughs> spoil it for anybody who, it's not really a spoiler, I don't, but for anybody who hasn't seen it, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty intense. And it, I love stuff like that. I was thinking a lot of uh, Richard Brake and uh, the, the intro to the film 31, Rob Zombie's 31. Yes. I was, I had a lot of that in my mind, just, you know, and I didn't want to overtop it or like, I, I wanted it to play kind of, and the way it's all cut together, I thought it came out very well, you know, black and white with the face paint. It looked pretty, pretty intense. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed it. I watched it twice and, um, that would have been good if it was like a feature film. I would go watch it if it was a feature film. I mean, there was like so much story to it where you guys could have went with it too, you know, and you could also could have had a continuation into another f- film from that. If you did the whole feature film way, you know, instead of the short film, I mean, you can do another sequel to the short film too. You can do another short film where it shows them what happens to him at, at the end of the box. But yeah, I would love to yeah. see, what happened to him after that final scene in that film? I want to know where he went or what he did or, or, how, or if he just went batshit crazy. Yeah. That's uh, one of the reasons we decided to end it that way is for exactly what we're doing now. So like you talk to people afterwards, after the screen and they're like, man, what happened to they talk about, usually they'll talk about one of two or the, like two or three things. It's a, uh, Oh my God! Remember the scene like the mirror, the clown in the mirror. Oh, that was creepy. That, or they'll talk about the ending because when it just kind of mm-hmm. ends, and people are like, oh, because it's not spelled out for you. Like a, they don't put like a. They're, they're, it, it's almost a question mark, like you said. Like, oh, I wonder what happened, or what's going to happen. You know, what's this? I don't know if some people could be take it the wrong way and get disappointed about it, but uh, it's we purposely kind of left it a little bit ambiguous, so. You know, sure enough, and they come out of the screen, and they're like, "Oh man, this, that, and then that scene, and then the shot where my the guy's looking, the guy, me, I guess, yeah. uh, looking over the counter as the box is opening." Yes, it's like a it's a long take. It's just one continuous take, and we did that purposely to build tension. Hopefully, it works. <laughs> oh, it did, it, and I love how it sh- it showed where you like look inside of the box. It felt like it was going like a long pit like you're 
going down to hell or some kind of other dimension. It just, I mean, you just felt like you were going with that character down into that box. I mean, that's how, that's how I, you know, felt, you know, I felt like I was going with that character down there going, okay, let's see where this is going to take us. Yeah. We actually wanted it to be a feature film and it, um, it actually still might actually now that you mention it, because we originally shot it to be longer. Obviously we wanted Mm -hmm. to have a feature and, uh, with, again, with everything that was going on at the time and, you know, timing and trying to get everybody together, we just uh, decided to make the overall decision to break it down into a, a a really good short as opposed to something that maybe went on too long. Mm -hmm. Right. So we shot a lot of footage. I'd probably say we got about maybe 45 minutes to an hour's worth of, uh, you know, a story shot. And then, uh, we had to trim a lot, but there's, uh, it might've worked out for the better because now there's been talks of actually being able to, uh, fund a feature version. Hey, that'd be cool. And I hope, I hope it really happens for you. Cause I really enjoyed it because I, I, there's a lot of uh, indie horror short films. I love watching, you know, that has the same type of intense and, you know, which really grabs you and plays with your mind. Those are the type of indie horror short films I like too. And this one really did grab my attention. <laughs> but um, also, we were, yeah, when we were talking, you said um, you had a part in a Danny Trejo film. How'd you become part of that, uh, a Danny Trejo film? I like Danny Trejo's films. Yeah, Danny Trejo's the man. He, uh, I worked, I worked with uh, the director, Victor Rios. Uh, he's on Denver. I worked on a project with of his, I think, about two, three years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, he's, the, he's the one who directed this film, Wages of Sin. And uh, he offered me the part. He called me up and he goes, uh, hey, I'm, I'm doing this project with Danny Trejo. You know, would you like to come out for a couple days? Uh, I'm trying to piece this thing together. And this, this was in... I think it was pretty much done. I just kind of came in for reshoots, like kind of pickups. So I was like, yeah, hell yeah, man. Anything you need. Like I said, he's another director, friend of mine that I love. He's got a great eye, knows his shots, knows what he wants. So when he called me up and offered me that, I was the first plane out of there. <laughs> I was there the next day. I was like, yeah, for sure. That's cool. So um, your friend you were talking about, um, does he do a lot of horror films too? Uh, this guy, uh, Wages of Sin? Yeah. The Danny Trejo director? Yeah. No, no, this is actually, I think this Wages of Sin is going to come out first. It's going to technically be his uh, debut. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's not a bad place to start, man. Your first film out and you're doing a Danny Trejo film, right? That's pretty good, I think. That's cool <laughs> to be able to get Danny Trejo in your film like that, man. I I bet when he you know wrote that film and everything that directed it all that, I mean, he probably put his blood, sweat, and tears in the film and then really getting Danny Trejo to be part of that, man. That's good for somebody, you know, doing their debut film like that, having a having a big star like Danny Trejo in the film, you know, just to get into the world of indie filmmaking. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, uh, that's not a bad place to start. You know, you're going to hit the ground running, I guess, right out the gate. Uh, that's your first project. So my hat's off to him. I love the kid. He's a good kid. He's, uh, I think he's he's definitely got a bright future as far as uh, filmmaking goes, for sure. Well, I'm gonna have to definitely check it out and look him up and see, you know, what he does next, and you know, uh, you know, get a chance to see that film when it like finally, you know, comes out. Like, like, I'll, um, I think I think there's a there's an early teaser, there's a trailer that I'm gonna shoot. Uh, yeah, there's a trailer. I'll have to shoot you over the trailer for it. Oh, I definitely would love that, and. Um, I can't wait for uh, when uh, We Are Here is, you know, going to be popping up. So is We Are Here, is that going to be like, you said it was going to be distributed. So is it going to be, is it also going to be at uh, film festivals eventually? And is it eventually going to be in streaming or where's this going with We Are Here? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, there's not a whole lot I could really say about as far as distribution goes, but Uh I know for now... They've been hitting con and they're hitting all the major festivals. The Asian film market is coming up again. Um, a couple months more toward the end of the year, like I said, they got AFM looking to do something there. I think they're going to have a screening there. 
but uh, it's going to be probably world. It's definitely going to be worldwide. So it'll hit all the festivals, I think, get some buzz from there, and then it'll probably distribution everywhere for sure next year. I would imagine. That's good, man. Um, First quarter, yeah. Because I love foreign indie horror films, especially like from Thailand, uh, Korea, China, um, Italy. Uh, those filmmakers really get into it, and, it, and it, I think they make the, I think they make one the best uh, horror films out there today. I mean, don't begin around. There's some great American horror filmmakers out there, but I think the. I think the foreigners, man, make some pretty badass horror films, man. Oh hell yeah! There's there seems to be no rules in a, in a weird way. Having been there and, and seeing the stuff that they're able to get away with, I, I don't think there's a lot of stuff that kind of yeah, not not really censors you, but limits you in a way. A lot of times, I think here in the states, as opposed to some of the stuff you see that they get away with, like Korea, for example, the Korean horror films. Uh, a couple of years ago, the French extreme films, remember like uh, High Tension and Inside? Yep. yep. All those movies, just crazy freaking movies, man, that would just never be released, at shit, especially today. But uh, at the time, it was just like, you really, if you really want something really, really original and just insane with no limits, it's, it's, it's great. It's a great time to be a horror fan and to be able to explore, you know, Korean horror film, French extreme underground all this crazy stuff there's so many different directions you can go and it's nine times out of ten you're definitely going to be uh you're going to see something you know <laughs> you know then then you go deeper and you go into like the serbian film territory <laughs> you know just crazy insane shit you know there's a lot of it delivers that. i mean you've done so many different roles and so many different g- g- genres of films um do you see you doing um more horror films than any of all the other genre of films you've done, do you see yourself more of a a horror actor than all, some of all the other films you've done? Um, maybe it's it's probably yeah. I think it's definitely my favorite genre. I'd love to be able to you know stay stick around in the horror genre for a long time. It's uh, like I said, I'm a a kid of the '80s and a, a '90s teen, so. I, I we grew up on the you know the mom and pop video stores mm-hmm. and uh, all the you know you just Friday night whatever we're walking into the video store and looking for the craziest box cover art you could find and just going oh man look at this I have to t- I have to get that you know there's a half naked chick on the cover a demon or whatever the hell it is it's like man look at that that's I'm all the way in on that you got me you got me hooked so it, yeah, yeah I, I remember I this and, you know, action drama. All that stuff is great, but horror is definitely my uh, my go to for sure. Since horror's your go to, what's your go to horror film? You can just like when when you're not like filmmaking or in front of the camera or doing your job. What's that one film horror film you can go home and just grab and watch anytime you want? Well, I know a lot of people don't consider it a horror film, but uh, The Exorcist. Wow. Exorcist for sure. A- any time, any day, no matter what's going on, I could I could dig the original film out because it, it still holds up today. There's, uh, you know, they've tried to remake it. They've tried to re like do sequels and spinoffs and knockoffs and all kinds of stuff. But that original film, there's just nothing. And as a as a guy with two daughters, especially like I couldn't imagine. I could not imagine that. <laughs> Seeing my daughter go through either one of them go through that, walking in, head spinning around, puking, crucifix, all that shit. I'd be like, that is the biggest horror to me. I think as a father, and and the, and the pretty scary thing about that Exorcist film, uh, that shit could really happen too, man. You can really get possessed, man, and that would be a scary thought being possessed by some crazy demon and you doing some messed up stuff. Yeah, it, I've come close to it a couple of times over the years. You know, you get messed up on something and you have a good night out drinking. They're like, oh, it wasn't my fault. I was possessed. <laughs> <laughs> I was possessed by alcohol. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that's as close as I've come. Speaking of your daughters, um, are they um, are they big horror fans? Um, I don't know if I'd call them big horror fans, but uh-huh. they've definitely, uh, 
you know, they dabble in the stuff every once in a while. They like a good horror film. They like my youngest daughter, especially um, Emma, she really digs the slashers, like the like the Scream. Those have been kind of redone now. They got like the last, I think, what is it, five and six? I think were yeah, the most recent ones. Yes. They go to see them. You know, they they still go to the theater with their friends when they come out. And it's cool because it just reminds me of us when we were growing up. You know, it's like, oh man, if it wasn't the video store when we were kids, and then as we got older, we go to the movies and go see all the crazy movies. So they do the same thing, and yeah, I, people have asked me too. They're like, "Oh, how does it, how do you have younger?" You, I started this. The girls were little, and my first couple of projects I did, I'd come home with the makeup on and stuff, and they they know how it all works. You know, they they're like, "Oh, that's so cool! You got to be a zombie here. You got to do that." And, you know, they they know how it's all done. So I think it's a little bit easier, maybe in a weird way, to have. Uh, and I know a lot of other my, my fellow friends who are in, involved in. The industry have kids too and it's probably say the same thing they're like oh they know how it all works they know it's all scripted daddy's playing make believe and now they're grown up now you got one's going to be 18 the other one's going to be 21 uh, couple in a couple of days so yeah and they they uh they dig all that stuff they've they were raised by me so they've there's nothing they probably haven't seen <laughs> I, you know something they probably have seen they probably seen everything with you it's like I wonder what dad's going to be watching next. I wonder how messed up this film's going to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, there's some limitations only. Like I, I don't, I don't really, you know, anything that kind of goes a little too far. Like, but as far as like heads flying off and, you know, blood guts and whatever, they don't, that doesn't fit. It doesn't bother them. Cause they've seen it all. If they haven't seen it in a movie that we were watching, they've seen me do it. They've been on set with me a few times, you know, so. It's, it's always uh, I, I think that's like again it's it's one thing to tell somebody oh that's not real you know that that's all fake but they've actually got to see how it's all done and they, they're actually at the age now where they're interested in it and they love watching the documentaries and all that stuff too, which I love too I'm a documentary nut I love behind the scenes anything behind the scenes I'm, I'm a sucker for yeah I'm a huge sucker for documentaries of all kinds um, the latest documentary I watched too, you can you can call me a nerd on this one. Um, I watched the latest one on uh, Jim Henson, the creator of the Muppets. How that? That's weird you mentioned that. I just saw the trailer for that uh, coming down here. I thought it, I thought that that was out a long time ago. Didn't they do one? Uh, uh, Jim Henson a few years back. Um, they I think they did something totally different on this. This just came out. You can watch it on Disney Plus. And it goes in how he really wanted to work on television, how he wanted to get into a puppeteering, which is pretty good too. But um, everybody, um, everybody have a great evening and thank you for listening to Horror Pop After Midnight.